Greetings, gentlemen. Hi, everybody. Greetings. Good evening. I make sure I got the right Weather microphone. Weather is very different. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah, there we go. Yep. Yeah, you're good. So the weather is uh, not cooperating tonight. Well, we have cloudy skies. It's windy. It's cold. It's cooperating if you're a meteorologist, <laughs> but it's not cooperating <laughs> if you're an astronomer. Um, that's unfortunately true. Yeah, yeah. Um, but for those of you who have uh, uh, joined us on this uh, Easter weekend, uh, thank you for tuning in, and uh, we're here at the Chabot Space and Science Center, and behind me is Nellie, our 36-inch research reflector, and uh, uh, well illuminated by lights, since we're not going to be using her tonight because, uh, because of the weather uh, just previously mentioned by Ger Gerald. So we've got high humidity and high clouds, and uh, although there are some sucker holes out there where we might be lucky enough to see something... Uh, we really can't open the roof tonight. So we have a lot of interesting news for you, and we have uh, some uh, uh, nice photographs to present, and we hope you enjoy our program. Before we get started, though, um, I do want to remind everyone that the Chabot Space and Science Center is uh, uh, preparing to reopen later this year, hopefully in the fall. Uh, but in the meantime, we do need your support, and we need the support from the community. And if uh, uh, you are so inclined there is a button on the Facebook page that will allow you to make a donation uh, and if you're on YouTube uh, you can visit the shabospace.org website and make a donation there and we want to thank Fremont Bank as well uh, for their ongoing uh, support from the community uh, and uh, uh, great help to Chabot Space and Science Center uh, all right, guys. Uh, Gerald, I think uh, we were going to start with uh, your big astronomy news of the week, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to you because it's a really cool story. Well, actually, it's a really hot story. Okay, yeah, really. Yeah, yeah so um, some of you may remember last year we were uh, doing some imaging of a distant uh, galaxy called M87. It's an elliptical galaxy, and the reason we were... Uh, imaging that galaxy is because there had been recent news where a team of astronomers using radio telescopes spread out over the entire world uh, were able to capture an actual image of a black hole. There is a huge black hole at the center of uh, the M87 galaxy. It's more than six billion times the mass of our sun. And they were actually able to get an image of that black hole. Uh, now, when you saw the image, you just saw what looked like, um, you know, a black dot with a kind of an orange, fuzzy orange uh, pattern around it, which was the accretion disk around the black hole. Uh, but recently, they've done some additional work. And we're pretty sure that most black holes are spinning. And as they spin, uh, the material that accretes onto the black hole uh, spins with it. And basically, the material spirals its way into uh, the black hole. So they were able to actually confirm that. So I've got some images that I'm going to share here. Uh, I'm going to start out with our image from uh, last year that we took. See if I can get that up here. Okay, here you go. So this was an image we took with our telescope here, our 36-inch reflecting oh, telescope. Yeah, I remember that. The one you see just over uh, Richard's head. Um, and this is M87. M87, like I say, is an elliptical galaxy. Elliptical galaxies don't have the spiral arms in them. They're not the flat disk with spiral arms that you see in a typical galaxy image. They're more uh, roundish or football shaped, uh, American football that is. And <laughs> um, M87 is a bit unique because it has this little spike that you see here and it's not very clear but if you look carefully you can see a little spike extending off to the side that is uh, a very high velocity jet uh, a hot plasma that's shooting out of the galaxy at near the speed of light 
a very strong jet. And that jet is being produced by the black hole at the center. And theory says that it's being produced because of magnetic fields in the accretion disk and around the black hole, channeling hot plasma um, up into the jet and shooting it out. Um, so uh, the this, this same team of astronomers, uh, they, they're called the Event Horizon Project or something like that. Uh, they uh, decided they wanted to see if they could actually quantify or somehow measure the magnetic field. And they're doing this with uh, uh, radio telescopes. There are several radio telescopes that are on different parts of the Earth. So when they all work together, you end up with an image as if you took it with a telescope the size of the diameter of the Earth. And so you get extremely high resolution. And that's how they were able to capture the image in the first place. This time they did something a little different. They took the images using polarized energy, uh, radio waves, um, uh, light waves, electromagnetic waves coming from an object often uh, occur in in such a way that the waves are, are following uh, a, a path where they're basically going up and down in the same direction. So they are what we are called, called polarized. Now, if you've ever bought polarized uh, sunglasses or anything like that, you have an idea of what I'm talking about. The polarized sunglasses only allow light that has a certain polarity to enter through the sunglasses. And they're doing sort of the same idea here with the images they were taken of the black hole at the center of M87. Um, let's see here, I'm... Uh, Got to get things lined up here. There we go. All right. Um, so what I want to do is kind of show you one of the images that they took. So I'll stop, stop to share here. And this is the one that they just captured. Actually, they captured it a couple of years ago, but they've been processing it. And this is the result. And so here you see the accretion disk around the black hole. Black holes in the center. That's the part that you can't see here because it's a black hole. Um, but you can clearly see material is spiraling in. And what these are, these are magnetic field lines that are wrapped around the black hole in the accretion disk. What you don't see in this image is there's actually other magnetic field lines that are perpendicular to the accretion disk. And this combination of these magnetic field lines plus those vertical uh, magnetic field lines, uh, the hot plasma that is caused by material being sucked into the black hole, that hot plasma can follow along the magnetic field lines. And if they follow in the right direction, they can be captured and actually ejected out of the black hole, back, ejected away from the black hole, rather than being sucked into the black hole. And that happens with a heck of a lot of velocity. And that is what is producing the jets. So I've got another image I'll share with you here. Um, I, I would also think that that plasma along with those powerful magnetic field lines are the reason uh, black holes are uh, notable X-ray sources. Exactly, right. Um, so these are images just taken at different times and you can see the pattern of the, the spiral as it's, as it's spinning around the black hole and material is, is spiraling in. The magnetic field lines are changing shape and here they've actually mapped the direction and intensity of the magnetic field lines mm -hmm. and you can see it varies over time. And that's because this material is spinning at a very high rate of speed uh, around the black hole as most of that material is spiraling into the black hole, but some of it is being caught up in those vertical uh, magnetic field lines and ejected out uh, basically from the poles, if you will. So, so perpendicular to the, the accretion disk. So, you know, I, when I look at this, I get really excited because this is really cool because it proves theory up until the, they took these first images of this black hole. 
everything we knew about black hole was based primarily on theory or on how the black hole was affecting something else, something far away from the black hole. This was the first time they were able to actually image a black hole. And now they're able to image these magnetic field lines and actually show that spiral spinning of the, uh, the accretion disk into the black hole uh, and, and map those uh, magnetic field lines. Uh, this just proves theory and it's, it, to me, it's very exciting. I know some people are probably looking at this and saying, so what? But to me, this is very exciting. And to a lot of astronomers, it's very exciting to see this actually demonstrated uh, and, and conforming so much to what theory has told us was happening. So that's my story. <laughs> it's very cool. Yeah. That's pretty good. Or very hot. That's right. Yeah. It's very hot. Yeah. I mean, I remember um, when when we were looking at the first set of images uh, from this team and I was reading the stories about how they were shipping these crates of hard drives all over the planet to be able to gather the data at Berkeley, where I th believe they were doing most of the data reduction uh, for this project. And uh, they literally had, you know, the crates of hard drives tons, from tons these radio, tel <laughs> these radio yeah. telescopes and they yeah. got to process all that data they've got to take it and yeah. get it all matched up so that yeah. like i say it, it, you in a sense create one big giant telescope the size of the earth yeah uh, and that's the only way you can get this kind of resolution you know pretty remarkable project now now one thing just to to answer a question that i often get asked here let me go back to my i'll get there <laughs> well, i guess <laughs> gotta remember which which button to click to get to this image so when we talk about a black hole we say this this dark area is the black hole the black hole is not an object. It is a region of space. The, what's at the center of the black hole is what we call a singularity. And uh, what, what you gotta try to get your mind wrapped around is that you've taken the mass from six billion stars and you've squeezed it down into a point smaller than the head of a pin. And surrounding that point is this region where if you get inside that region, you can't get out and light can't get out. So it is the, the black hole itself is not a solid object. It is a, a, a spherical shape region of open space. Um, and anything that happens inside that sphere cannot be observed by anyone outside of that sphere. So the material in the accretion disk is slowly or actually pretty rapidly spiraling in. And once it crosses what we call the event horizon, it cr crosses that point at which escape velocity is the same as the speed of light. Once it gets closer to the singularity, then that point, that's when we say it has crossed the event horizon. Anything that happens after that, we cannot see or measure in any way from outside of the black hole. So it's a common misconception that this dark thing is the actual object. It is not an object. It is just a region of space in which everything that happens, we can't see. Okay. Good explanation. Yeah, yeah, I was yeah. thinking the same thing. Well, played. yeah, it's it's no wonder that uh, black holes make for such good science fiction stories. And uh, the, they always bring out a lot of questions. I see some yeah. comments yeah. about a, a ten year old who got interested in astronomy because of black holes and black hole imagery. So, oh. yeah, you, you know, fascinating when we, things. When back in the before time, before COVID, uh, when we had lots of kids coming up here all the time. One of the most common questions we would get asked is about black holes and what are they and, you know, is it true that they suck you in and everything and, <laughs> and you know, it's a lot of fun to answer those questions, yep. uh, but it's going to be even more fun now because we got actual pictures to show them. That's right. I, I, whenever someone wants to see a black hole, I just invite them over to look at my garage. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's, right. that's, right. that's, right. that's my I, 
<laughs> I see a comment on YouTube from Paul yeah. Chapman. He is the one that asked me about this last week. Uh, uh, because he was reading about this. So he's Paul has always been very interested in M87 to begin with. So, yeah. So Great. Well, thanks for uh, the suggestion. Uh, I think this is a good story. Yeah. Um, I have something. Let me get my uh, image up. So last week, we were uh, talking about M51 and uh, trying to get some images of M51. Uh, M51 is a galaxy uh, near Ursa Major, uh, northern part of the sky. And uh, it's an interesting galaxy. It's actually two galaxies that have engaged in several collisions with one another. And uh, there's a stream of stars between them. And Gerald and I were uh, attempting to take a photograph using the DSLR camera. And it was, you know, it wasn't anything great in the way of the photograph. We got some a little bit of detail on the spiral arms, and we were able to see the second galaxy. And then, Gerald, I remember you showed us uh, a CCD image, a monochrome CCD image. Yeah. yeah. And um, uh, that was pretty nice. And uh, I think that was uh, like a five to 10 minute uh, total uh, uh, set of exposures. I and think, I can't think remember about, what it was. Yeah, it was actually, I think a little bit less than five minutes. It was a, a series it. of 30 second exposures, but I think the total time was less than five minutes. Well, um, a local astronomer uh, who is a member of the Mount Diablo Astronomical Society and an accomplished uh, astrophotographer, uh, his name is Drew Lamphier. Uh He shared this with me today, and I want to show this photograph if I could find it. Give me a sec here. Uh, of course, it's not showing up. Let me find it. All right. There it is there. Share screen. Aha! Here it is. There we go. And uh, this was taken here in the Bay Area uh, using an 8-inch telescope and a monochrome CCD camera. And you could see the two galaxies that I was describing. This is the main larger galaxy, beautiful spiral galaxy. And you could see this streamer of stars uh, connecting it to this other galaxy that it has repeatedly collided with. These two galaxies are effectively in orbit around one another, and they've probably had multiple collisions over you know, the last several billion years. Um, Drew told, told us that this was 20 hours worth of exposure time. And, hey Richard, uh, yeah. I, I just want to uh, have you um, explain something. You said oh, it's sure. a monochrome image. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. This was taken. I was just getting. I was just getting, I was just getting oh, to that. Okay, good. Just getting that. You read my mind. <laughs> Sorry so about it, that. It's a, monochrome, there. it's a monochrome camera. So when you use a monochrome camera, you might be asking, well, how do you get all these colors? Well, you have this device that sits in front of the camera they called a filter wheel. And what you do is you take some of the exposures in monochrome and you take some of the exposures in red and some of them in green and some of them in blue. And then you put them all together and, and balance the color uh, and the U to uh, create an image such as this. Um, and the, the monochrome part of the image is what gives us uh, a lot of the detail and a lot of the texture of the photo and the uh, RGB images uh, fill in the color. And uh, so most of the image that he took is con consists of monochrome, 10 minute monochrome, uh, what we call subframes. And then all of those are stacked up, put together. I think he has only 12 uh, red, 13 green, 13 blue, and all the rest are monochrome and then stacked up and presented uh, as you see it. And you can also see there's another little galaxy here in the background. Yeah. Way in the background. Just, you know, just notice that. Anyway, so thank you, Drew. Thanks for letting us use this tonight. And, and interestingly, this is basically the same technique that the Hubble Space Telescope uses. Sure. Uh, they do the same thing. They take images using multiple fil filters and then they combine them to produce those spectacular images 
uh, that you see from the Hubble Space Telescope. Now, I'm pretty sure that the image that you're looking here is a true color image. So he's, you know, yes. he's combined all these colors, but he hasn't manipulated them in any way. So that was his intention. And uh, you, you're exactly right. Uh, normally, Drew does what's called narrow band imaging. And he, in fact, it was it was uh, commenting that he had forgotten how to do RGB. And uh, I guess it had been so long since he had been uh, since he had done true color. Uh, narrow band imaging is when you are looking uh, specifically for the light given off by uh, certain types of hydrogen atoms, oxygen atoms, and uh, sulfur uh, atoms. And you're able to see a lot of detail and uh, uh, energetic events within the object that you're photographing. Uh, whereas an RGB image is an enhanced version of what you would see with your naked eye you can imagine if you were to travel to this galaxy and be seeing this galaxy from your spaceship that it might look something like this to your eye and that's the point of an rgb image right now one of the other things they do with the hubble is they will take not just the red green and blue they will go different basically wavelengths within the red range and different wavelengths within the blue and so on. And then they may or may not combine them as their correct colors. So they may take a blue image and when they combine uh, the images, they show it as blue. But they may take one of the uh, images taken with one particular wavelength of blue and say, we want the detail in this image to stand out. So they change the color. And they actually have a standard that they use for doing that. And they call it the, the Hubble palette. And so a lot of times the images that you see from the Hubble Space Telescope are not true color images. They're images where the colors have been manipulated. And the reason they do that is so that fine detail in the image can be brought out and you get more contrast between uh, one particular set of details in another. Uh, so it just helps you to, uh, you know, see more clearly what's going on within the galaxy or whatever object that they are uh, photographing. Very cool. Uh, yeah. All right. Let me uh, stop the share here. and We'll move on. Uh, we could take turns, Gerald, if you've got another item, or I can move on. Uh, you know, I done. don't have a lot else right. to look well, I'll, at. I I'll go have, to the next thing. I do have our image of him, the, the one we took. Uh, oh, go ahead and show it. Yeah, sure. Okay, hang on here just a second. It's a, it's a good image. It's just you know, you were, you were talking about the luminance yeah. uh, part. That's what we shot here. Yeah, so, there you go. Perfect. So you can see all this detail that stands out in this image. Whereas if you took a red image, you wouldn't see quite as much detail. A blue image wouldn't show quite as much detail. But by combining this uh, monochrome image, what we often call the luminance image, with the red and the green and the blue, then you get all that detail plus all of the colors as well. Right, so, exactly. All right. And uh, it's the luminance part that's really important to have, sh you know, sharply focused as much as possible, because that's where all of that detail and texture is. All right. All right. So the next item I had, um, I know it's been a while since we were talking about uh, planets. Um, and I think most of us have had kind of, you know, Figured we're done with Mars for the year, right? But uh, what popped up on my desktop today was the latest image from Damien Peach. And oh, uh, Damien, boy. of course, is one of the uh, 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 best planetary photographers ever. And uh, he's, he's world renowned. Especially when it comes to Mars. And he has figured out how to take, uh, you know, uh, amateur telescopes, you know, either 11 or 14 inches and create images as good as uh, as we see from spacecraft orbiting the, those planets. So I'm going to show you his latest one of Mars from uh, March 30th. So it was just a few days ago. And uh, oh, wow. you can see the incredible detail he's able to get. And this is now Mars is not that big right now in the sky. So it's kind of hard to get this kind of 
uh, uh, resolution. Uh, you've got to be very patient. You've got to take a lot of video and really uh, uh, sort through all of the frames to find those good ones, uh, those moments of perfect seeing where you can stack up the frames and create a, uh, uh, a beautiful high resolution image like this. And the uh, feature that's really prominent here, there's actually a few features that are very prominent, but the, the big prominent feature here in the center is Certus Major, which is a volcanic region on Mars. Um, it's uh, very obvious even in the most modest telescopes on a good viewing night. Um, and of course, we also see the polar ice caps, both the northern and southern. And, you know, ice cap here and ice cap here. Um, and uh, a very nice color that he got as well. And uh, Anyhow, I thought I would share that. It's an amazing picture. You can see that it's already somewhat gibbous, so it's yep. it's yep. well well past uh, uh, what's the term? <laughs> I can't. Opposition. Uh, opposition. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, do, you yeah. do you know which telescope he used for this? I do not, and I wish I did. Um, I'm going to try to find out. I'll let you know and maybe uh, come back next week with that information if I can. If it turns out he used his 11-inch Celestron, I'm just going to give up astronomy. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, there's a lot of – I know. It's like I, I see stuff like this, and I just like, throw up my hands and say, why do I bother? <laughs> 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 no, but, uh, uh, you may have heard uh, John use the word gibbous, and what he's talking about is this shadowy region on the left-hand side of the image. Kind and, of like the phases yeah, of the moon. Very similar. Exactly. It's, I used to mistakenly call these uh, uh, a phase. It's not really a phase, but what it is telling you is that the sun isn't facing the planet straight on. It's actually hitting Mars uh, oops, sorry. <laughs> it's hitting Mars on that menu that dropped down. It's hitting <laughs> Mars uh, more to the right-hand side, illuminating this uh, area here, but leaving this back portion in shadow. So you can kind of get a sense of the geometry that's going on here. And that's called a gibbous, a gibbous Mars, I guess, <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, we're going to have a conjunction of Mars and Venus later on. I think it's in July. Oh, I was not aware. So, yeah. uh, so Is that, that will be, be... Uh, visible in the, at night? Uh, uh, no. Early evening. Early evening. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. yeah. yeah, both will be very close to the horizon. Uh, so gonna, That's going to be tricky to see. I'm going to have to go yeah, take a I, telescope up to uh, Grizzly Peak Road or something. Yeah, I think it's March, yeah. I mean, July 12th is the date. And they won't be as close as uh, Jupiter and Saturn were, uh, um, you know, last year. But uh, still, they'll both be in the same part of the sky. And probably uh, you'll be able to see both of them with pair of binoculars, but not with a small telescope like you could uh, Jupiter and Saturn last year. All right. All right. So now I've got, uh, oh, there was one other thing I wanted to mention. Remember I was uh, asking you, Gerald, whether the, uh, the plasma and the uh, powerful magnetic fields were also responsible for the X-ray emissions from a black hole. Right. And you, you confirmed that. Uh, there was an X-ray discovery much closer to home this week. And uh, on the planet Uranus, uh, it turns out that it is an X-ray source. And uh, most X-ray uh, 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 emissions from planets are because of scattering from the sun. You, the sun also emits X-rays, X -rays, and, yeah. uh, and those can reflect uh, and in just the right when you have just the right geometry, but the quantity uh, coming off of your Uranus is uh, greater than what can be explained by simple scattering. So that is suggesting that there are aurora and uh, powerful enough uh, magnetic fields on that gas giant to uh, actually act as an X-ray generator 
not just uh, one that is reflecting and scattering yeah, X-rays. Yeah, yes. and, and, go ahead. Yes, yeah, so what that means is that the solar wind, as it blows past uh, Uranus, the magnetic field of the planet uh, deflects the solar wind towards the poles, just like Earth's magnetic field deflects the, uh, the uh, solar wind towards the pole, producing those aurora. But the more energy you put into it while you're doing that, the higher the frequency or the shorter the wavelength of the energy that's emitted by that uh, material. And so that's what's happening here. It's, it's so energetic that it's emitting x-rays. All right, so that was our that was our X-ray solar system news for the week. Damn. So, <laughs> all right, so now I'm gonna now I'm gonna put you guys on the spot. Oh god! All right, and, <laughs> and, and our, our, oh oh, before I do that, uh, Bob uh, Bob Shaw came back to us and said that Damien did it with the C14. I saw that. Oh. Thank you, Bob. You saved me uh, plenty of. Uh, oh wait. We're getting we're getting from Tim Thompson. Damien says the image was made by a 100 millimeter uh, RC Richie Chrétien uh, telescope. So 100 millimeter? anyway, 100 That's millimeter. That's even worse. <laughs> all right, all right, Gerald. Uh, let's just shut down. See you guys. We're gone. <laughs> That's uh, it. Yeah, I'm that done. Bring you up. All right, um, you guys uh, who are who are watching us tonight can play along with this. Um, so here's the question. Let's see how you do. And just just before you start, just oh. for those of you who tuned in late, <laughs> the reason we're not putting the camera on the telescope tonight is because we've got bad weather up here at the Shua Space and Science Center. Uh, we are completely overcast. The humidity is kind of high. And so uh, we are not able to operate the telescope tonight. So we are virtually virtual or yes. <laughs> virtual virtually or however you want to say it. So anyway, just so I'd clarify that. Virtual squared or something like that? Yeah. There you go. yeah. Uh, it, with, the, with the only difference tonight being that Gerald and I are actually at the observatory. <laughs> right. So it's like that's the difference between that and our other virtual virtual uh, program. So you say. So, yeah, right. I could be a background image. Yeah. That's right. How would you know? Right? That's right. Okay. So here's the question. There are nine constellations that are named after birds. And I want to know if you guys can identify oh, all God. nine of them. Oh, geez. And not only identify the name of the constellation, but what the bird is. I can think of one. Six, what? Six. Corvus. Okay, wait, 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 Cor wait, wait, wait. Corvus the crow, crow, Cygnus the swan. Cygnus. Okay. Um. Um. Altair. What is a? Uh, okay, wait, wait. Eagle. Okay. Yeah, right. Okay. Aquila. Okay. I'm up to three now, right? <laughs> okay, we got three. Okay, what you've got? This is significant. You, what you got are the three in the northern hemisphere. <laughs> Oh, oh great! So, <laughs> yeah, what you got? There's the only place. three yeah. in the I northern quit. hemisphere. Yeah, yeah. Now, oh you've boy, done the, you've done the easy one. You've done the easy one. Uh, there is one other that you can. Wait see a minute. Let me start up Stellarium and all. Yeah. Oh no, he can't cheat. We can't cheat. Come on. <laughs> How about Phoenix? Yeah, yeah okay. Phoenix. Yeah, Phoenix. Okay. Phoenix is interesting because it's kind of a mythical bird, right? Right. right. There's not a real bird called a phoenix. I don't but think. it's still a bird. But it's okay. It is one of the nine. <laughs> it is one of the nine, so it counts. Uh, okay, you stumped the stars. All right. So the, <laughs> so the other one that you can barely see from the northern hemisphere, if you're far enough south, is Grus the crane. Oh, okay. Right, uh, and yeah. that is uh, that's right below sculptor, right? So if you if you're like uh, uh, looking directly south in like uh, September or October at around midnight, uh, that's pretty much the lowest constellation in the south that you can see, uh, or maybe one star of it, right? The other is uh, the others are Columba, the dove, hmm. Apis. Which is a bird of paradise. Isn't there a, a toucan or something yes, like that? Yes, toucana is the toucana. Oh, that's right. That's right. Toucana, and that one, that one, I'm kind of surprised you didn't get because there's some yeah, pretty, yeah, pretty yeah, significant, I know, I know. some pretty significant uh, clusters in toucan or toucana, and pavo, the peacock. Uh, 
right? And that's nine. So we had Corvus, Aquila, Cygnus, Columba, Grus, uh, Apis, Pavo, Tucana, and Phoenix. And uh, the reason this came up, oh, and of course, you know, you wouldn't expect Tucana to be in the Northern Hemisphere because no one knew what a toucan was <laughs> when they were naming the uh, the Euro when the Europeans were naming the constellations originally. Um, so that, well, that is was a, that was a, before yeah, Disney movies. That was before <laughs> Disney movies and uh, and uh, uh, colorful cereal boxes and things like that. So um, the the uh, the uh, uh, the story that was associated with this, which led me to uh, uh, bring this up tonight, was I was reading an article about bird watchers uh, from earlier in the 20th century and when they were studying uh, migratory birds they wanted to understand the extent to which birds migrated at night and how nighttime migration changed uh, during the year for a particular species of birds. And the way they would do that, it's kind of hard. How do you count birds at night, right? So what they would do is they would take telescopes and they would point them at the moon and they would wait to see the silhouettes of birds pass in front of the moon and count them. Wow. And the density of birds would, of course, influence that night's count, and that density would change over time during the migration season. And I thought that that was that was actually just utterly in insane. <laughs> to wow. Imagine sitting there at a telescope waiting for birds to pass in front of the moon. Yeah, who but came it, up it, with that it, idea, I right? No, it's, it's a great <laughs> idea, though. It's a, I mean, how else would yeah. you have done it, right? Yeah, what, other, yeah. what other method could you, well, have, used? you, you and, have? You have some portion of the sky, and you yeah. uh, use it to uh, you know measure what goes through that portion, and then you extrapolate to the rest of the sky, right? Right. I, I thought not, you were going to tell us something about birds migrating and using the stars to navigate or something. Well, they do that too, I think. And that was another part of the article, but I wasn't going to bother with that tonight. I thought the other part was enough. Well, and, you know, uh, you mentioned you, you know, one, of the, one of the constellations we mentioned is Corvus the Crow. Yeah. And for those of you who uh, want to check out some other virtual programming, next Friday, uh, April 9th, we're going to be doing the Sky Tonight uh, program and I'm going to tell you a little story about Corvus uh, the Crow and oh, great. how he got up there and how he got his very offensive voice and uh, it's an interesting story. This is a great story. I've heard yeah. it from Gerald before. So yeah. Oh, good Definitely news, Gerald. Good yeah. news. Uh, Tim corrected himself and uh, Damien Peach used a C14. Ah, oh, good. You can relax. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll relax a little bit. Yeah, I right. know a lot of what he used. He does. He he has yeah. the same mount that I have, and he used to do a lot of this with an 11 inch Celestron, which is the same telescope that I have. And when I saw what he was doing with that, that setup, which is identical to mine. And I, I just kind of said, you know, forget it. <laughs> I'll just chase asteroids. And, Leave the leave the. You're you're never going to catch up to them, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> so. All right. Well, that's what I have tonight. All right. Well, uh, I see uh, Jerry Lehane has uh, suggested a way to get rid of fog. Uh, I don't think that's going to work for us. <laughs> what, what was the suggestion? What's the Dropping suggestion? dry ice chips from uh, a balloon towed by a truck. He says that's, <laughs> how, they, that's how they do it at airports. <laughs> ah, I see. And so, we can just build a special road around the observatory yeah, here. Right. We're trying yeah. to be continually operating with those uh, dry ice balloons. And, yeah, uh, that'll this take won't care be of the too problem. expensive at all, yeah, will it? No, it won't be just a piece of cake. And the neighbors, I'm sure, won't complain. So, uh, you know, folks, you, you can submit questions. So if you've got anything you want to talk about or ask us about, uh, you know, go ahead and on either Facebook or YouTube, just write your questions in. We'll be glad to uh, take a stab at answering them. I've seen and a lot of, as, of as always, comments. As um, always, if we don't know the answer, we'll make up something. You know? Right. So. 
I've seen a lot of comments on on Facebook, but not too many questions. So we'll I saw something if pop up, up earlier uh, where somebody was asking about X-rays versus gamma rays. Um, it might be worth talking about exactly what X-rays are. So, you know, X-rays are a form of light. So light, visible light, that, you know, uh, red, green, and blue light that our eyes are sensitive to are anywhere from like 500 to 700 nanometers in, uh, in wavelength. And uh, the X-rays, though, are like way down like 10 nanometers. And so they're very energetic. Uh, they have a very, they're very, they're very fast. Uh, and they can penetrate um, uh, uh, other other um, molecules uh, and uh, in such a way that they pass through materials rather than just reflecting off materials. That's why x-rays are used to photograph the inside of your body, right? Be for that very reason. Um, shining a bright light on you is probably not going to have the uh, desired effect if you're trying to identify a broken bone. Um, but x-rays are very good at that. And then gamma rays are even more powerful. They have even a uh, smaller uh, uh, wavelength. I don't know what that is, Gerald. Do you happen to know where gamma rays yeah, are? I was just trying to look it up, but uh, I haven't found it yet. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but it's, like you say, it's even more energetic. These these different wavelengths actually represent different uh, amounts of energy. So if you take something, uh, say a, a hot gas, and you heat it up to a certain temperature, it emits infrared energy. If you heat it up even more, then it emits uh, visible light. If you heat it up even more, it emits ultraviolet radiation, heat it up even more, and it, it emits x-rays, and you heat it up as hot as you can get it, and you're going to get um, uh, gamma rays. So uh, all these different types of waves uh, coming from astronomical objects, they tell us about the temperature of those objects. Um, and you know we we talked earlier about uh, that that hot material falling into a black hole. It gets so hot it actually emits X rays. Um, when a, a star explodes in a supernova, things get so hot they it emits gamma rays. And there are other events going on out in space that also emit gamma rays. And and one of the interesting things um, happened early uh, on in in um, satellite type uh, astronomy is we didn't realize that there were all these things out there emitting X or gamma rays, uh, but we did know that nuclear explosions emit gamma rays. So back in the uh, 60s, late 60s, when they were uh, trying to develop methods for confirming that both the United States and the Soviet Union were complying with the test ban treaties, uh, one way to do that is to put a satellite up in orbit around the Earth that is sensitive to gamma rays and a nuclear explosion would emit gamma rays, right? So they put this thing up there in the orbit and it's picking up gamma rays all over the place. And they didn't know what was going yeah. on. And eventually we realized that these were bursts of gamma rays coming from supernova explosions or other events, sometimes billions of light years away. Um, so that was kind of a, an eye opener. And since then, of course, we, we study gamma ray bursts quite a bit and, and actually have satellites specifically designed to detect them. Great. Uh, uh, Joan, uh, who is one of our uh, 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 participants tonight, uh, gave an excellent explanation and wrote it up here. Uh, <clears throat> X-rays and gamma rays have the same basic properties, but come from different parts of the atom. X-rays are emitted from processes outside the nucleus, but gamma rays originate inside the nucleus. They are also generally lower in energy, the X-rays are, right. and therefore less penetrating than gamma rays, which is why gamma rays can do damage to your DNA much more effectively than X-rays. <laughs> well, right. that's why staying, yep. you know, hanging out around gamma ray uh, sources is generally a, considered a bad idea. 
Yeah, in fact, uh, the the process that drives the sun, uh, the fusion process at the core of the sun, the energy that that fusion process emits is gamma rays. Um, the problem is that happens deep down inside the sun at the core. And those gamma rays go out and they're, they're completely surrounded by this dense gas, which immediately absorbs the gamma rays, but then re-emits radiation at a lower uh, energy level. And that continues on until eventually that, that what started out as gamma ray energy at the core comes out of the sun at its surface as infrared and visible light. Uh, so, and it's caused by this constant absorption and re-emission of energy uh, as it works its way up from the core to the surface. And that process can actually take 100,000 years. So you have right. a photon that's at the energy level of a gamma ray, leaving that fusion process at the core. By the time that photon works its way all the way up to the surface, it has, it's taken 100,000 years. I'm, I'm trying to stop from bursting out laughing here. Richard Navarrete said, Hulk, <laughs> Hulk says, stay away from gamma rays. <laughs> they turn you green. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they'll make you green <laughs> and ruin your clothes. <laughs> <laughs> All, right, All right, that was good. Do we have any other questions tonight? We had a request uh, for images of Andromeda or other galaxies in the local group. Hmm. Um, I don't know if we have anything. Well, we have certain from uh, our telescope. Gerald, Gerald certainly has some uh, Andromeda shots handy if we want to put one up. Well, uh, the request was from our telescopes. So, oh, uh, from our uh, telescopes. I don't yeah, know if we have any. Yeah. Any. Let's see. I'm not sure if I have. Andromeda, of course, Andromeda is so big. Yeah, it's pretty uh, hard to photograph. Yeah, we would only yeah. have a, we would only have a partial from Nelly, right, and right. we might have one from uh, Rachel somewhere. Um, to answer Cadillac Black's question, does Nelly have a sister? No, <laughs> Nelly Nelly is an only child. Yeah. Well, Leia, Leia well, and Rachel are sisters. Has, they're cousins. No, they're sisters. <laughs> Are they sisters? Oh, Rachel yes. and Leia are sisters. Rachel yeah, and Leia. I'm yes. talking about relative to Nelly. Okay, <laughs> yeah. sorry. Yes, yeah, no, I know. I, I know Rachel and Leia are sisters. I see somebody ask what mount I use. It's a Celestron CI 700, which they don't make anymore. Um, but Damien Peach. Oh, uses, here's a good question. How many the same mount? How many galaxies are in the local group? Oh God! That's a, that's a really that. good question. I don't yeah. know the answer to that. Well, I'd, I'd have to look that one up. Okay, there, it's the... more than you would think. Is I know the answer. Uh, is 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 uh, they they are always finding additional ones that are colliding with uh, our galaxy. Yeah. <laughs> well, there are else... dwarf galaxies in there too. The. Uh... Um, Brandon is is uh, uh, asked an interesting question. He says, "Hi, there have been some photos this evening with great detail. Thanks for explaining the color filters. Um, even with multiple layers photos, the brightness blurs out most of the detail. Are there lumen levels or color filters to be applied to the live photos for more detail? Not really. See, the the problem is is um, with with astrophotography." What you're really doing, what when when you acquire an image with a lot of detail and very high resolution, you're spending all of your time trying to beat down the noise, because you are. Uh, when we take a photo of something out in our yard or on the street, the uh, the light and, and the brightness and the bright areas of the photo, going all the way to the dark areas of the photo, cover the full gamut. Uh, the full range of the sensor's capability. But when you're photographing uh, something in deep space, uh, everything is shoved over to just the dark part of the spectrum of, uh, of data. Um, everything is all the way over to the left-hand side of the curves. And so what you got to do is stretch that very narrow amount of data to cover the full 
gamut of visibility to our eye. So it's not just this very dim uh, blob, but instead you stretch it so you could see the details. And that process brings out all of the noise as well. So you have to gather lots and lots of these subframes and spend lots of time gathering data in order to improve the signal to noise ratio. And so when we're doing a single shot of 30 seconds with the DSLR camera, it's going to be mostly noise and there's no good way to get rid of that. And you'll notice that even on your own cell phones, even cell phones that you know, brag about having night photo capability. You actually try that and use it, and you'll see that there's all of this speckled noise that still remains. And we have that in buckets full uh, when we're using these larger sensors. So it's a tough problem. And as time goes on, we may find different cameras or try different cameras that allow us to take and uh, more images and stack them real time to try to improve the signal to noise ratio to give you all a better, uh, cleaner image. But right now, that's what we got. Hey, Richard, somebody yeah. asked about an image of M31. I've got one, uh, and it shows that basically all you can see is the core and not much else, but I can Go share ahead, put it. it up. Go ahead and share it, right. giving right. people an idea of what we're talking about here. Yeah. Also, it's been stated here that there are more than 30 galaxies in the local group. That's a lot more than I thought. Yeah, me yeah, too. I was right. It's always more than you think. So, so this is this is an image taken with our 36-inch telescope of the core of the Andromeda galaxy. And as you can see, if if I didn't tell you this was a big, huge spiral galaxy, you wouldn't know it. You know, you can see the bright core. You can see a little bit of the dust and gas clouds. Uh, in the spiral arms, but you really don't have any sense at all that this is a full-size spiral galaxy. You can start to imagine that it's extending out in the upper right and the lower left. Right. And right. you get an idea of it, but it's really hard to see it in there. You know? and, and the reason for this is M31 is the closest full-size galaxy to uh, the our, our home galaxy. And it is actually quite large on the sky. Um, if you could turn up the brightness to where you could see it easily with the naked eye, you would be surprised to see that its, its distance across is about six times the diameter of the full moon. So it's really very large. And our field of view of this telescope is actually smaller than the diameter of one full moon. So that's mm. why we, we are not able to get the entire galaxy in our field of view with this telescope. Cool. Okay. Thanks, I'm glad you found that. Um, Stephen asked, is there a preferred camera for astrophotography? I'll tell you, yeah, <laughs> there, ask, ask, a, ask, a hundred, ask, ask a hundred astrophotographers and you'll get a hundred different answers. Uh, but what, so I could talk about that topic for probably two hours and put everyone to sleep. Yeah. But the um, I could there are lots you, of preferred I, cameras. I right? could tell you that there are three general types of cameras. And one is kind of the classic CCD camera, uh, which is using a camera based on what's called a charged coupled device. And uh, it's an older technology, but they are very sensitive. Um, they are falling out of favor right now, and people are moving on to oh. what are, yeah, they're falling out of favor by the industry that makes them more than the people who use them. Yeah. Uh, the cell phone industry has changed the nature of camera sensors dramatically, and now uh, astrophotographers are, are purchasing what are called CMOS cameras which are using uh, larger versions of the chips that you find in your cell phones. Uh, the problem with those CMOS cameras is they're not, the, at least previously to do this year or last year, uh, previously they were considered not anywhere near as sensitive as CCD cameras, but they're catching up quickly. Uh, they also tend to be noisier, but that's also being uh, resolved by the industry. So CMOS cameras are going to catch up to CCDs 
and it's just a matter of time, not not if, but when. Uh, some people uh, claim that's... that that's already happened. Um, and then the third category is uh, the DSLR camera. And the nice thing about a DSLR camera is you could also use it to take pictures of your cats and dogs. Uh, and then uh, if you want to, hook it up to a telescope and use it as a uh, camera on a telescope. And there are special models of those cameras as well that are designed for um, astrophotography because they've had certain filters removed from the sensor that make it more sensitive to uh, red light. So I hope that helps. Hey, uh, Chris Larson has asked a question. Besides the Pleiades, Orion, and, and Bumblebee, uh, what are Bumblebee. some good galaxy clusters right now that he can look at? Well, actually, actually it's quite a bit. Uh, there are several uh, globular star clusters that are starting to show up uh, at night. Uh, M3, for example, is uh, one that's that's up right now. That's a globular star cluster. I think M5 is also up. Um, and there are some brighter galaxies. Uh, M51 that we were looking at a while ago, that is up. And if you've got a good dark sky location and you've got an eight inch uh, schmidt cassegrain telescope, uh, that is uh, an option as well. Um, there is a uh, planetary nebula called uh, uh, the Clown Face Nebula, I got to get it right. Uh, the <laughs> Clown Face Nebula that's that's uh, in the constellation uh, Gemini. Uh, that's another thing that's up there. So there's actually quite a few objects that are that are up right now. The the faint fuzzies. Uh, you should probably get yourself uh, a a uh, you know a star catalog or a list of the Messier objects. Um, and look at the brightness uh, listed for each of those objects and, you know, pick the brighter ones and see if you can find some of those. Uh, speaking of catalogs, I, I do want to share something. Um, a, uh, a, a former Bay Area um, uh, visual observer named Alvin Yui just released his new book. Uh, it's actually a new revision of his book, Observing the ARP Peculiar Galaxies. And this is several hundred pages of uh, galaxies and uh, pairs of galaxies or trios of galaxies that are unusual. They're considered unusual galaxies. ARP galaxies have been uh, distorted in some way by uh, collisions or other gravitational effects that have caused them to take on unusual shapes. So the disks are either warped or they've been disrupted or they have rings around the core of the galaxy or any number of possible uh, permutations of galactic collisions. And this is probably one of the best books if you're interested in uh, observing these, uh, talking about faint fuzzies, they are faint fuzzies. Many of these are impossible to observe unless you've got um, like an 18 inch to a 30 inch telescope. But there are sections of this book that have brighter ones that are uh, uh, visible with a uh, eight inch to, four to 14 inch telescope under uh, dark sky conditions. But I just wanted to give him a plug for his book. His name is Alvin Yui and he has other books as well, uh, other observing guides. And uh, he, he, he can be, uh, uh, or his books can be uh, seen at faintfuzzies.com. <laughs> Speaking of faint fuzzies, yes. I see a question here. Who uh, numbered all those M objects in the sky? And uh, <laughs> the answer is Charles Messier. Charles Messier was a French astronomer in the 19th or 18th century, rather. Um, he had a telescope not quite as good as ours. And Charles Messier got this idea that he could make a little extra money by discovering comets and then getting rich people to pay him to name the comets after them. Uh, so what he would do is scan the sky looking for these faint little fuzzy objects in his telescope. And then he would watch them over time to see if they moved relative to the background stars. Well, 
as you can imagine, he would have every once in a while discover a faint fuzzy object that didn't move. It was a galaxy or a nebula or something like that. And, uh, you know, he would kept, kept rediscovering the same ones um, and, you know, spent a couple of nights watching them, waiting to see if they moved and they didn't move. Uh, so he finally got smart and he made a list of all these faint fuzzy objects up in the sky that did not move. And he ended up, I think, with 104 in his original list. It's now up to 110. Um, and the M number is simply what sequence number it was in his list. So M1 was the first one he saw. M31 was the 31st one he saw or added to his list and, and so forth. So today, Charles Messier is not known for any comets but we still use his list of um, faint fuzzy objects. We call it the Messier catalog. And so when you hear us talking about M3 or M13 or anything like that, that's what we're talking about. And I, I have to say that anybody who gets a new telescope and you're starting off, the first thing you do is try to get through the Messier catalog right. <laughs> yeah. and, and yeah. learn how to find every one of those objects without computer aid or at and least then a you good will know, and then them. you will know and then you will know the night sky yep, yep. hey steven asks uh, is there any news about the nova that we observed a couple of weeks ago in cassiopeia huh. uh it's it's sort of faded uh literally and and in terms of news worthiness it has kind of faded out uh, you know which is typical uh a nova like that uh when it first happens, it gets very bright. It can be 10,000 times brighter than the star was originally. And then it fades over a period of a couple of weeks and eventually goes back to being its original um, brightness, which was, in this case was extremely faint. I think we came up with the like 13th magnitude or something like that was what it was originally. And it had brightened. And when, when I imaged it uh, two weeks ago, it had brightened to magnitude 6.8, which is a lot brighter than magnitude 13. So, uh, but, but it has started fading now and that's typical of what Nova's do. Here's a question from Margo and little, little V um, is it possible to view Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto through Nelly? Yes, it is definitely possible. All we've, three of them. We've seen yeah. all three of them using yeah. Nelly. Yeah, we've had all three uh, during our uh, Saturday night program. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And yes, Pluto is a planet. <laughs> it's a dwarf planet, but it is a planet. So, uh, Bob wanted to know... Uh, what projects Nelly is used on, and uh, mostly mostly uh, near Earth asteroids. Yeah, in terms of science projects, yes. Yeah. But, you know, whenever we get back to normal up here, we will use Nelly quite a bit for public viewing, uh, for education with scouts and and youth groups and so forth. Uh, that's well, that's our our normal thing to do. Plus, we are this telescope is part of a global network of observatories that searches for and tracks near Earth asteroids. And so we do regularly submit data. In fact, I was just doing it a few nights ago. Uh, tracked six different asteroids, uh, all of which had not been seen for a while, and they needed more data to refine the orbit and that's what we do here. We also use uh, a Nelly and the other two telescopes for special events that are held up here. We get weddings or parties, uh, and special groups can have can rent the uh, the telescopes for their events, and it's uh, it's a lot of fun. When we start opening up again and uh, the uh, the pandemic settles down a bit. All right. Okay. I think that's it. I think uh, the questions have uh, come and gone. And uh, unless you guys have anything else, uh, I guess we'll call it a night. Yeah, All right. Like it's a little after 10. Okay. Yeah. Well, right. just, just want to remind everybody next Friday, uh, uh, April 9th, we're going to do the star. Or I'm sorry. Sorry. The sky this month program. Uh, that's going to be at seven o'clock. Uh, on uh, Chabot's Facebook and YouTube channels. And you can join us then. We'll tell you what kind of constellations are up. I know a couple of people were asking what's up 
in the sky right now. So that's a good time to find out. And and I'll tell you that story about Corvus the Crow. <laughs> hey, one quick question before we stop. Uh, Lisa asked, will you continue to do this for uh, these virtual programs on weekends after Chabot uh, opens up again? We are uh, we talking will. about doing that. Yes. We However, are. not necessarily on weekends. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we, 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 we've been talking about this. We, we obviously are not going to do it while uh, the public is up using the telescopes on Friday and Saturday nights. So uh, there will be a certain consideration of doing it midweek. Right. Or something. Or something. <laughs> yeah. We'll figure or, something. Or who knows what. We don't we'll, know yet. We'll do we something at least. We will we do something. We just don't know for sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. One, one way to make sure that continues to happen is hitting that donate button. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, everyone. Uh, thanks for watching tonight, and I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, we'll see you next time. All right. Good night, everybody.